and welcoming Professor Harry Lindbergh. Geologists frequently make claims like uh, this one, that this island is in a great measure an epitome of the globe, and that the observer who makes himself familiar with our strata and the fossil remains which they include has not only prepared himself for similar inquiries in other quarters, but is already, as it were, acquainted by anticipation with what he is to find there. And zoologists also flattered themselves with similar synecdoches. They asserted that Britain offered a most interesting epitome of, uh, of the animals of this earth, so there was no need of foreign aid in acquiring the first principles of zoological science. One interview, uh, one overview, I should say, too modestly actually, suggested that with the exception of apes and monkeys, there are few African quadrupeds that have not some relative, however humble, in these islands. What do the Victorians have to say about this? And um, I might be biased because I'm a Victorianist, but I do find that so much of our contemporary 21st century concerns, anxieties, obsessions, um, you know, the Victorians do have something to tell us about that, and we've either forgotten it or we need to rediscover it, or, or through our research need to sort of reconnect the contemporary with the Victorians in ways that can shed light on, on our own situation as, as well as showing us another dimension of the Victorians. I've had a long interest in issues around sustainability. I have a, a very long standing interest in the slow food movement as a, a contemporary development that's sort of a reaction against some of the excesses of modernity. So that idea of, of modernity and critiques of modernity is something that has um, been present in my work, you know, going back to my um, beginning of my career. And that is something that I have found the Victorians have a lot to say about. So obviously for me figures like William Morris have been a really important um, touchstone for those sorts of issues. That connecting up of, of politics and of everyday life and of the aesthetic and the material and the sensory, Morris is really um, such an important figure for all of that and Morris still is someone that people turn to today for that. So yeah, Morris and then more recently Morris's wife Jane Morris is a figure that I've uh, looked at in my research. John Moores has uh, its own resource where we're going to have all of the catalogue data under a Creative Commons licence so that if you don't subscribe to the Punch archive itself, you can still search through the contributors and then take it to hard copies of the volume. So there's very much two sides to the project. How are you hoping that this is going to change scholarship on Punch magazine? I think in the first instance it's going to open up the textual uh, side of punch much more. I think people are quite familiar with the visual side, particularly the main cuts, um, but I don't think people have really dipped into the textual side. There are a number of, for example, one-line quips, which can be about things like the Thames pollution, um, and they're quite a rich resource that haven't been tapped into yet. So I think on that side of it, that's going to make a contribution. But I think on the other side of it, actually being able to identify the authors, who is writing on what topics consistently, what their background is, changes that understanding of the marketplace as a network, which I think people are starting to look into. So Punch has never really been a part of that Wellesley tradition of identifying. So for the first time, you're going to be able to conjoin it with some of that established scholarly work. Uh, this paper represents a preliminary work for me, it's a bit transitional, so it bridges the gap between my doctoral work, which is on human-animal entanglements and interactions at Bristol Zoo, and the next project, which is more about the links between captive spaces and wild spaces from the end of the 19th century through to now. So I'm testing some ideas, and I'd be really interested in, in hearing what you think of them. Between its foundation in 1835 and well into the, the 20th century, Bristol Zoo was absorbed with an extensive global trade in wild animals, engaging with mariners, circus showmen, travelling menageries, and a number of individuals 
both connected to the society and also somewhat divorced. The animals that travelled along these pathways, along the pathways of these appropriative networks, were highly valuable, lively commodities. So commodities that were living, but nevertheless highly valuable. Yet the values were rarely uniform. In terms of methodology, the question that we've been um, thinking of and dealing with is what I consider the big question in not only Victorian studies, but most literary studies in the modern period in Britain. And by modern, I mean from the 19th century to the present. And that is, how do we understand global processes, large processes, um, acting in particular environments without losing uh, the specificity of the local? So you have local environments crisscrossed by global processes, and I'm going to talk about the methodology of how we do that.